The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Apparently, reports are people like last week's message, how do I do that? Well, this is how do I do that part two. And one of the things that we've learned, even from emails uh, over the years, uh, we pay attention to different parts of the country, out of the country. When they comment on our teachings, you pay attention to it, you learn from it. But one of the things that always stuck was the person who said, someone that had been a Christian a long time, 30, 40 years, and said, here's someone telling us how to do what we already knew we were supposed to do. And that the Bible is rich in what to do, but not necessarily is everybody mentored to learn how do I do that. Hmm? Have you ever gone to a meeting and saw somebody say something or do something and say, well, how do I do that? That's good for you. I'm glad you can do it, but how do I do that? And so uh, we kind of got the reputation over the years when we traveled church to church as the how-to people. So hopefully uh, there's some of the things that we've learned over the years, the how-to to make it simpler for people to literally prepare for what's coming, to make ready a people prepared, Luke 1, 17, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, to the, uh, the disobedient, to the wisdom of the just. And so we're going to do uh, part two. But... Uh, <clears throat> We've used some terms in the past that uh, sometimes people go, where is that in the Bible? So I'm going to tell you where it's at in the Bible when I use these terms that are kind of new to you, like drop down. They go, where is that? In your New Testament, it's everywhere there's the word put on. Put on. You just ignore that stuff when you read. Put on the, the new man. Put on the Lord Jesus. Put on the armor of light. Put on, put on. But that word is in duo. And it means to sink into in order to be clothed. You go down before it goes up. To sink into in order to be clothed. It's kind of like baptism in water, isn't it? You sink into the element to be covered. And the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind, but you have to go to Jesus, who is your peace, down before he comes up. So now you see where bucket man's going? Abiding, John 15, is actually teaching people how to keep the bucket down. But location seems to be a problem. Now, here's another word. I really believe in the time and season that we're living in right now, one of the pre primary requirements for, for a believer is really the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge and understanding because this relationship was supposed to be real. It's not about ink on a page. I feel sorry for the people that spent their whole Christian life reading and studying and scholarly applying uh, the, the truths that they've had in the Bible and trying to live the Christian life in their own strength. It was meant to be reality. It was meant to be a relationship. It was meant to be spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. It was meant to be an organism that was living and breathing. And uh, another word uh, that we commonly use without an explanation is the fear of the Lord. And some people don't know the difference between fear of God in an evil way and uh, the fear of the Lord in a reverential uh, respect. But the word fear of the Lord comes from the word yara, Y-A-R-A. -A. So I want to kind of briefly cover that before we get any further. The literal translation of fear or fear of the Lord in the Hebrew is yara, which means, listen to this, to flow from the gut. How about Jesus saying, out of your belly will flow rivers of it? And, you know, we've so superimposed that word heart to where I think we've actually confused people because we think it's this heart. When the heart is bowels, belly, gut, womb even in uh, some translation of the Hebrew, it's lower than that. And uh, Jennifer did a scientific study, and I thought it was interesting. Uh, she uh, studied the, um, uh, the neurons. I'll probably mess this up, so... You can ask her later, what did he mean by that? <laughs> but it's like the neurons in your brain, it's like a computer, right? But the neurons in the gut are like a computer. 
and some are even calling it in the scientific community, the second brain. It knows stuff that this head doesn't know. And as a matter of fact, uh, when, when firemen and policemen talk about going with their gut, they're not even Christian, but they know there's an intuitiveness that comes. And I'm saying, this, this, uh, this, for a believer though, this yara flows from the source like a river. And uh, all of the scriptures, the, it was the way we were meant to live. You were meant to walk in the spirit, well there's a flow. It's, it's not just a choppy do this and then do that and don't do this and don't do that and do this. And it's a flow of life. When you're surrendered to it, it's like that flow is to be unhindered. And that's actually abiding, John 15. Uh, so anyway, uh, the interesting thing about Hebrew is that it's a pictorial language in which the meaning or the essence of a word is tied to a visual word picture. So we have visual help, visual aid today. Don't talk while I'm talking. Okay. Um, <laughs> very obedient subject here. Uh, but why is this important? Because just like a tree uh, derives its nourishment from the root system. You don't see it. You see the manifestation. Well, God wants the manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, but the divine nature is within for the born-again believer. The divine nature is within, and you need to learn how to operate from within. So this word yara means to flow as water. Uh, remember, this is the fear of the Lord. I don't, I don't hear trepidation in here. I don't hear uh, tension. I hear respect, honor, knowing that, that the, the fear we're talking about is honoring him enough to stay connected to him, to reverence him, to respect him as a person. Uh, you, you do things and behave with a person differently than you do with an it. That's why it's very important to know the Holy Spirit is a person, not an it. You do things with an it that you wouldn't do with a person. And you would treat things to a thing differently than you would treat a person, hopefully. <laughs> so this uh, yaro means to flow as water. And the picture of flowing water, let's look at that for a minute. If it flows, it flows from a source. And uh, like a watershed, a spring, a lake, there's a source to the flow. It flows as water from a source, bringing life wherever it flows. Boy, there's a picture of this in Ezekiel, isn't there? To where it talks about the temple and the house of God and how that from the base flows rivers of living water. From the base, out of your belly flows rivers of living water. From the base, from the heart. You know, Matthew 18 says, unless you forgive from the heart. And when we travel church to church, Jennifer and I found there's people trying to forgive somebody for a year, two years. You know what that told me? They weren't doing it from the heart. They're doing it from their head sincerely. That can work against you, can it? To be sincerely wrong. Or doing it wrong. I think we need some how-tos in the church. Because we've got plenty of sincere people that would like to do what's right. How do I do that? All right? So hopefully we're going to cover some how do I do that. Because God's going to teach us to live from the inside out. And the fear of the Lord is flowing with him and not getting out of that flow. That's when you're walking in the fear of the Lord. When you're in the flow and you don't get out of the flow. Your goal is to stay there. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, living from that inside out. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Uh, all right, you're kind of getting it. So put on is to drop down, to sink into in order to be clothed. Then once you're there, you want to flow. Right? We saw that uh, 96-year-old man who was married uh, for, I don't know, 60-some years or something. And uh, his wife's name was Florence. And uh, they said, what's your secret? You've got such a happy marriage. He goes, I just learned to go with the flow. <laughs> all right? <laughs> Wise wisdom for us all, right? Just say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Things would work better. Okay, so how do you do that? Uh, last week we covered uh, the fact that... Uh, I read the Bible, but how does this all work? And uh, the thing that got me 
was knowing that this relationship of flow is a living water and that the word is a living word. And I had to get out of my head that the Bible is not merely ink on a page. And so even when I would read it, I would read and feed. I would drink it in. I wanted to meet the author of that word experientially. I didn't want to just get more head knowledge. And so I would drink as I was reading and I would feed as I was thinking. I would look for any nuance that changed in me to where I felt like that word was speaking to me, something that God was getting my attention. It increases your sensitivity to the spirit when you don't just uh, think and read, but you drink and feed, all right? Now, the word of God is active, powerful. Everyone should look at Hebrews 4.12. But the eye-opener for me was... Verse 13, it re-clarified to honor the Word of God as a person. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So we got to get into the reality of a relationship. It's not about religion. Religion doesn't work. Religion is drudgery. And religion will actually work against relationship if you let it. No. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful. There you go. Sharper than a two-edged sword, able to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. But here was the eye-opener for me. Verse 13. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him. We're talking about a person, aren't we, with this word of God? That's quick and powerful, sharper. It's living. It's active. Well, it's not an it. It's Him, and He dwells in us. And we need to meet Him in the Scriptures, spirit to spirit. Now, I want to go over a few things. I have this illustration up here because when we traveled, we saw well-meaning Christians, knowledgeable Christians, unable to do some of the simplest actions like forgive. When you got saved, forgiveness was instant. If forgiveness is not instant, you're apparently doing it wrong. All right, But listen to some of these scriptures, because I want to get, it's like real estate. The, when we travel, and every time, every church has different pastors, they have different emphasis, they have different giftings, and all that's fine, but we would kind of set our radar to hear what is the flavor or the tenor of that particular church when we would minister. And one of the things that was common to almost all of them, including some well-known churches, um, Real estate, spiritual anatomy. In real estate, they say what? I don't know if it's still true, but location, location, location. We found out Christians, we would say, uh, where's, where's, your, <clears throat> where's your will? And they point to their head. Okay, we have problem number one. That is not the door of the heart. Jesus did not stand at the door of your head and knock. Some of you needed it, but he didn't do it, all right? He don't operate that way. So we had to show him, here is your thoughts. And quite frankly, the second brain is the seat of the emotions is right there. What else is right there? Conscience. You know what else is right there? The door of the heart, the will. The only thing that's up here is your thoughts. And we taught this to third graders. You know what they said? One child raised his hand and goes, everybody knows there's no living water in your head. Where does the living water come from? Out of my belly flows rivers of living water. And you say, well, that's King James. Well, you know what? Some of the other translations that say heart, there's only one verse in the entire New Testament that pertains to this heart the blood pumper, and that is that men's hearts will fail. You know, you can get a heart attack if you get enough fear in you. <laughs> Anger doesn't help either. But this is like, there's some neurons in there too, by the way. And that's why it gets affected. But this is like a computer chip. This is a computer, this is a computer, and this has a little computer chip. So I, I'll tell you what, too much emphasis on this. I say worship people, or they hold their heart like this, I'm sorry. You know what? 
You really need to know that it's flowing from the belly, from your innermost being. Let's look at some scriptures. Proverbs 20, verse 27. This is a good one just to get some bearing on location, location, location. All right. Proverbs 20, 27 says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Some new translators say it, a flashlight. Okay. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. Is that accurate? Is that scripture? Yeah, it's a scripture. Well, what's it mean? Is it just poetic? No. It means the spirit of man, all right, I believe the spirit fills them head to toe, but the epicenter is right here. That's the door, the will. God, you have a spirit, but the activity happens here. Conscience is here. Did you ever do something or say something and down here and went, eh, a little buzzer? You know what that meant? That was your conscience. Conscience is the voice of your spirit. The voice of your spirit is here. It will inform your head. As a matter of fact, Jennifer teaches too the, the, uh, the second brain or the gut, all those neurons. Uh, the left vagus nerve connects it to the head. So when something happens, it informs the head. And we used this illustration in part one that if there was a loud crash in here, all of a sudden, <laughs> from down here, fear, apprehension, would, uh, the seat of the emotions would cascade throughout your whole body before this thinker even knew what was going on. Your thinker would catch on later and say, oh, okay, uh, Rebecca dropped the ladder. I had to make it personal there. So... <laughs> Are we getting location a little bit? The seat of the emotions, conscience, spirit, at least the epicenter, the will, and we would go to churches, well-taught churches, famous pastors, and we would ask in a congregation of a thousand, point to your will, 98% pointed here. So if there's a problem with location, do you think it will have a problem with function? And it has nothing to do with sincerity or Bible knowledge. It's application, 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 and location, location, location is necessary to be properly understood. So the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inner... When you say, search me, O God, it ain't searching your head. You do that. I can't think of anything they forgive. You know... Well, you're not smart enough. You let, you let the Holy Spirit pick the cherries, you know. You let him go. Look, David, there's humility. David said, search me, O God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. Search me for secret faults. What, what are secret faults? David goes, I don't know. <laughs> I'm asking you. I'm trusting you. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I trust you to be searching out where the tangles are. I'm not smart enough to know where all the tangles are, nor do I know the proper sequence in untangling it. I watch Jennifer work on a necklace sometimes where the chain gets tangled. That's a long, difficult process. You have to have patience. You almost need surgeon's tools to facilitate a, a result. And that's really, I only trust God in me. He made me. If he knit me together in my mother's womb, he's the one that I want untangling the knots. And in his order, not a Christian counselor, not a psychologist, not my best friend, not my husband, not my wife, none of that. I want, those are opinions. I'm going to go to the source. If you want to know the purpose of a thing, don't ask the thing. <laughs> ask the creator. Now, it says... It searches all the inward parts of the belly. Uh, Jennifer said that in the late 1990s, even uh, biology has, has uh, made a change. They call it emocognition, emovolition. The emotions affect your choices, and the emotions affect your thoughts. And I was thinking, if I was angry... I could, with my mind and my will, I could override it and smile. <laughs> but you know what? That anger doesn't die. It gets buried alive. And what gets suppressed will get expressed later. That's when you go home and get, slam the door. Because you were smiling when you didn't deal with it. 
Emotions don't die, they get buried alive. And emocognition, emovolition says that, and they only discovered this in the 90s, that the emotions have much more power than they thought. Everybody's trying to renew their mind by changing their thinking. If you don't change the fear, anger, hurt, lust, guilt that's behind the thought, you don't remove the power base behind the thought, you're not going to renounce that thought, and you're not going to get the mind renewed. By the way, the renewing of the mind in the Greek, N-O-U-S, nous. Look that up sometime. Nous is mind, will, and emotions. All three of those bad boys have to be under the authority of the Holy Spirit for transformation to take place. You don't change your mind and leave the emotions and your will alone through some spiritual phenomena that I'm not aware of. And where you can validate that in the New American Standard, I like where it says, search me, O God, for anxious thoughts. What kind of thoughts? Anxious. Emotional thoughts. Hurtful choices. So you've got to deal with the hurt if you're going to make good choices. Mm -hmm. You've got to deal <laughs> with the anxiety or fear, fear-based, if you're going to have anxious thoughts. You're not going to deal with those thoughts very effectively until you deal with the anxiety. And, the, and only... I just love Jesus as the solution. No medication. And thank God for medication. For some people wouldn't be with us today if it wasn't for medication. But no medication, no counselor can take away your, your negative emotions. Nobody. Only Jesus can take your pain and your sorrow. You feel sorrow, grief, you can't take it. You don't, you, you, all you can do is suppress it. Find a substitute. And unfortunately, Christians who should be walking a much closer walk nowadays are walking inferior because they found substitutes to deal with everything. My people, in Jeremiah 2, 13, it says, uh, my people have committed two errors. They've forsaken me, the fountain. Where's that fountain? The fear of the Lord. They've forsaken me and they found, they've hewn for themselves cisterns or substitutes. You will find a substitute for everything that ails you. But those substitutes are, even if they seem good in and of themselves. I've seen people who used education as a pill. You can use sports as a pill. You can use something that's not in and of itself bad, but you're using it as a substitute, and what you really need is a deeper relationship with God. Now, here's another scripture. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. What's the soul? Mind, will, and emotions. All three of them bad boys. You have to quiet them because they're noisy. And what, whether the mind, the will, or the emotions are like three kids, whatever one's leading, he'll pull the other two along, go, come on, let's go do this. And then you'll be sorry. All right? But the intent is not to annihilate the mind, will, and emotions, noose, or to have your mind, will, and emotions renewed. All three have to submit to the lordship of Jesus. All three must submit so that God can use that mind, will, and emotions of you. You learn to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Why did God give you those emotions anyway? When I listened to early teachings of the church in evangelical circles, it was, just ignore those emotions. You can't live by those emotions. And that's a partial truth. You can't live by negative emotions. But if you've got a negative emotion, you ought to deal with it because guess what it's saying? Jesus isn't ruling right now. <laughs> when you're angry on the road, is Jesus ruling? You know, it should be a sign to you that... I'm the only one that can give it to God. Everyone else would like to give me to God, but I'm the only one that can go to God, right? Now, surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child with its mother is my soul within me, which means mind, will, and emotions need to be submitted. And how do you know if all three are submitted? If mind, will, and emotions are all submitted, you will have peace. He himself is your peace. And peace will guard your heart and your mind. Peace is militant. Peace is not just passive. Peace means that you have 
take in the strength from that mind, will, and emotions and giving it to God for his use, for his implementation, the way he sees fit, the way he wants to inspire your mind, the way he wants you to feel the, the fruit of the Spirit. That's why God gave you emotions, not to be problematic, but God gave you emotions so that the fruit of the Spirit would be an experience. Jennifer always tells of the time she went to a seminar on joy. Nobody had any, but they could tell you everything the Bible said about it. <laughs> Is that kind of like the state of the church, all of us at times? Huh? We can tell you what the Bible says, but we just don't have any of it. How do I do that? That's what we want to talk about. How do I get there? Well, first of all, in your prayer time, if you can't sit still, you've got those three bad boys running the show. And... They need weaned. They need to be yielded to the Lordship of Jesus. And that takes a little bit of time. But as you get proficient with it, it'll be easier to do than not to do. John 4.14, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, Jesus said, he'll never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain springing up. What's the presupposition there? If it's springing up, where's it coming from? Down. <laughs> this is not complicated. But if we don't get location, location, location right, this is your Bible heart, not up here. That location in itself can transform the way you read Scripture, the way you walk it out, because you want the reality. Proverbs 20, verse 5. Counsel, counsel in the heart of man is like water in a deep well. So bucket man would have to drop his bucket down here. And it's in the hidden part that you will make me to know wisdom. In the hidden part, in the secret place. Now, counsel in the heart of man is like water in a deep well, but a man of understanding learns how to draw it out. Oh, remember we said that the spirit of man is a can of Lord searching all the innermost parts of the belly? This is how you deal with gossips. Because it says that if you partook in gossip or you are the gossiper or you listen to the gossip, it says, Proverbs 26, 22 says, the words of a talebearer, gossip, are like wounds. They go down into the innermost parts of the belly. And then... From down here, they will come up and flavor your perception. Now, I love, I love the uh, message translation of the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Uh, the message says it's so much better. <laughs> it says the world is unprincipled it's dog eat dog out there the world doesn't fight fair but we don't fight our battles that way never have never will the tools of our trade aren't for marketing and manipulation but they're for demolishing entire massively corrupt culture and trust me if there's newbies coming to the faith You've been massively corrupted by the culture. You're, 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 you're like the early apostles dealing with the Gentiles. They didn't have an Old Testament. They didn't have a Ten Commandments. They, they thought, my favorite part was, it was so shocking, was if they had a baby girl and they wanted a boy, they left her out to die. They had to be told, don't kill babies. Don't, you know. Well, you know what? We have a culture that's, that's that degraded you would have to teach them what the Bible says is and what the Bible says not to do. And, and it's like, it says we have these powerful God tools. So that means they're ready and at hand. Where are these God tools? I keep pressing the wrong button here. <laughs> the God tools are in, in you. So they're ready. They're at hand. You don't have an excuse. You don't have to go run to somebody. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, no, you don't know what's happened to me. No temptation is taken upon you that isn't common to man. There's no new sin. What are you doing? <laughs> All right? So it says uh, these God tools, these powerful God tools, smash warp philosophies, arguments, 
that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Our tools are at hand, and we can clear the ground of every obstruction. Where's the ground we're talking about? I don't know about you, but we're talking about the ground of the heart. <laughs> That's where it needs cleared. You need root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, so you can build and plant something good. All right? But it says, and we can put them so that we can stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we walk away from, forget about it. This is for keeps. This is a life or death fight against the devil and all his angels. He doesn't give up. He always reminds me of the Hittites. That was a tribe that when they attacked Israel, they didn't win all the time. They just never quit. <laughs> Have you ever had things hit you like that? It's not so much that it overtook you totally, but it just doesn't go away. Well, we're going to learn how to submit to God. Submit to God. you got to drop down. You have to sink into. You have to enduo. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. I really want to cover that because the word of the Lord that God gave me for the, for the days ahead, a more current message, is on resisting. So I'm, hopefully I can get to that pretty soon here. <laughs> um, the, I think we covered some of this in part one. So listen to part one if you haven't listened to part two. Um, but the flesh wall, uh, we covered this, so I'm going to do it briefly. It doesn't work. You cannot be a healthy Christian if every time you're up against something that's uncomfortable, down here, down here, you put up a wall. You think you're protecting yourself, but that wall is flesh. That's not a God tool. That wall will not protect you. You put up, you tighten up in your gut, you're saying, I'm in self-protection mode now. And if somebody says something derogatory to you, it goes right through that wall. Yep. It's not very effective, is it? All those years you put up a wall with people and circumstances, and you thought you were really helping, you didn't do a thing. It still affected you. It goes through that. The only legitimate biblical wall is the peace of God that will guard your heart and your mind. And peace is militant. It's not passive. Peace really will guard your heart, but you've got to try it. You've got to sink into him in the fear of the Lord. The Yara will flow. As a matter of fact, uh, we prayed with a girl uh, before I even uh, did that, that word study with Yara uh, on the fear of the Lord. We taught a girl who was being... Um, bullied by girls in the cafeteria. They'd pick the cafeteria to come and invite her to a party and then disinvite her. I mean, they're just plain mean, mean girls. And they, and they would do this. And she said, Pastor Dennis, uh, you, you taught me how to forgive, and I've forgiven them. But it happens every day. So I said, well, let's go on the offense then. We, you know how to defend yourself, that if you take any of that garbage in, receive forgiveness, get clean, and get your peace back, all right, if you blow it. But out of your belly flows a river. I said, why don't you just go blast them with love? Before they even get started, before you even comprehend what they're saying to you, and they're going, ah, da, 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 da. And while they're in their little chit chat, you just from your heart, without even saying a word, or you could just, you know, mumble a few, oh, Lord, bless them. I just release the love of God. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm just going to release blessing to them. And she said the Holy Spirit turned her head while she was doing that. See, the stuff can't come in when your fire hose is blasting out, right? Be like taking a fire hydrant and trying to throw dirt in it when it's been opened. Now, it doesn't work. It'll blast you right out of the way. Well, she went like that. And because of her obedience, because of the love nature, because she was practicing love to the unlovely, in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit had her attention. She was under his rule. Love, peace is nothing more than love ruling and love resting. And she looked over and there was a table of girls and she just felt like she'd just go over there and introduce herself. Here was a table full of Christians that had been praying for her, and she became their best friends. You know, a lot of times you're in, the, you're in the wrong place, or you're in the right place with the wrong attitude, and your eyes are blinded to what God has for you. So, learning to not have any wall other than the peace of God. Any other wall is man-made, it doesn't work. 
And God wants us to stand. Okay, I got to get to the good stuff now. First of all, when we traveled, we saw there was a major problem with, unless you forgive from the heart, and many were sincerely forgiving from their head, and then it wasn't working. But when you got saved, you said, Lord Jesus, I opened my heart. And whether you knew it or not, it was down here, not up here. <laughs> you gave consent up here, but that's about as far as it went. The heart had to be vulnerable and open. And he's like, come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin, and I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. At least that's the way I prayed. Well, that was instant. I didn't say, I got to do this for two years. I've been trying to get forgiveness from God, but I've been, I just don't know. I'm sincere too, but I just can't do it. It just. As you received him, this is Colossians 2 6. As you received him, I just showed you how you'll receive him, right? Come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin, and I will live for you. Okay. As you received him, so walk. So, how do I walk? Well, when I put him on, I did OFF. I opened my heart, I received forgiveness, and the fruit of peace was evident that I was born again. My spirit bore witness with his spirit that I was a child of God. I had evidence, substance. That's what we call faith. Faith is substance, not nothing. Faith is substance. It's an assurance. Open, receive forgiveness, the fruit of peace. So it says, as you received him, so walk. So how are we supposed to walk? You're supposed to walk in, with your heart open, and a forgiveness lifestyle, and the fruit of peace will guard your heart and your mind. Peace should be the normative during the day. Now, I want to get into something. Peace should be the normative, right? Peace should be the normative. Now, the problem we saw when we traveled was people were getting confused with forgiveness and reconciliation. They are not the same. Uh, Forgiveness can be given by one person. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He was releasing forgiveness to mankind, whether they accepted it or not, whether they reconciled to him or not. Reconciliation requires at least two people. And it's reciprocal. It's got to be a two-way relationship. Forgiveness does not require forgiveness. Listen, I've seen this happen when we traveled. Forgiveness does not require the admission of guilt by the offender. You can go beat them over your head with a Bible and demand that they admit that they were wrong. That's not what forgiveness is about. Jesus didn't do that. Forgiveness may do them some good because you're... you're you're, you're releasing love toward them, really, because after you forgive, love is what's flowing out. But it really, it's what it does for you. That's the important thing. It sets you free. It isn't about the other person that much. Hopefully it does something, the mere fact that you're praying for them. But forgiveness does not require the admission of guilt from the other person. Reconciliation, really, pay attention to this because I see this mistake in the church a lot. It requires change from the offender before you can reconcile. Forgiveness, you release the offender. And if you want to reconcile, there must be a change in behavior. I've seen alcoholics and, and people that were physically abused, and they said, they said they were sorry. I want proof. There's nothing wrong with that. Was that who was that, that? Was that Reagan that said, trust, but verify. <laughs> okay, I'll trust you, but I want to see proof. Then you can have reconciliation. But forgiveness is a free, a free gift to the person who has broken your trust. No. It's extended even if it's never, ever earned. <laughs> because who's it, ultimately who are you doing this for? You're doing this to honor God, who says unless you won't forgive, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. So you're really honoring God about God. I really don't know what it'll do to that person. Perhaps, 
Perhaps, you know, the prayer will go forth and it'll accomplish something. Perhaps they choose to never respond. But you have to be made free. Now, when God was teaching me in the school of the Spirit, I got to get to this other part fast here. He taught me, I'm not going to go into this. We have teachings on this called the five loving functions of your human spirit. You have to learn how to receive, how to forgive, how to do loving intercession, how to uh, release. That was a common one. I think we covered that last time. They are God's servants, not yours. They belong to him. The difference between ownership and stewardship is usually confused. You don't own your children. You are called to be a steward. There's a difference. That's God's child. Those babies in the womb, they belong scripturally. They belong to God, not to you. You are merely a manager or a steward. No. All right, now I want to get to the good part. I've got some time left. Receiving, forgiving, loving, releasing demands and expectations. You know, that's the Romans 14, 4 in the Living Bible. They're God's servants, not yours. Da, 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 da. All right. But here's the one that I see. Resisting. Resisting. And here's what I feel like God has been saying. Uh, how do I do that? Well, I want to teach you to respond instead of react. All right. And to respond instead of react, you've got to learn the peace walk. You've got to, to endeavor to enjoy that when peace is ruling, Jesus is ruling. Let the peace of God rule. When he is ruling practically in a situation, in other words, if you feel nothing, bless God. There's people that would give their life fortunes for peace. They're on heavy medication. They've spent all the money they could and they still don't have peace. When you feel nothing, you are blessed of God. Nothing means that at least at this point in time, even maybe in my ignorance, everything's working properly. <laughs> Doesn't mean I know everything, but at least right now I'm doing okay. And there's people that would kill to get what I have right now. So never treat it marginally. Peace means stuff is in operation and it's functioning at least in the light that you have at the moment. Now, I want to cover the do's and the don'ts because God's saying, make ready a people prepared for, the, for, the, for an awakening. To turn them from the, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to turn the hearts of fathers to the children, children to the fathers. And we have what we call, and we have a teaching on this called the, the seven deadly seas. These were implemented and why they died in the wilderness. The disobedient children of God entered into these seven deadly seas. I'm not going to teach on it, but I'll give you the list. So you can go home and pray and say, which of these deadly seas am I welcoming death <laughs> to my personal happiness? What's robbing me of my joy? Okay. Number one, compete. When you compete... It's an uncurbed rivalry spirit, according to Dake, in business or religion. Competing. If we compare ourselves amongst ourselves, it's foolishness. I'm not going to give you scripture on all of this. All right. Compare. That's usually evil wisdom. Complain. Now, I know no one in here has ever done that. <laughs> That's really just lovelessness to God. Criticize. No one's ever done that, have you? Criticize. But they died in the wilderness because of these things. So these are clearly, don't do it. Repent. Treat it as sin. So after criticize was conceal. Those are secret faults. I don't want to go there. We pray with people that when they got into a vulnerable situation, they go, I'm going to pray about, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go there now. I, I'm not ready to go there. Well, you know what? You're hiding it from God. And that in itself is sin. He wouldn't have showed it to you to give you the option you don't want to go there right now. You don't want to deal with it. You're concealing it. David, on the other hand, in his humility, said, search me, O God, for secret faults. Secret to me. Because I'm humbling myself for the Lord because I want to go deeper. No. Control. 
There's even a place in Scripture where it talks about control for, amongst believers as will worship. Will worship is they're doing it their way, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, when it's convenient. But it's they're the center of their whole walk. Control. That's demonic will worship. And seven, covet. When you covet something, it's just idol worship. Okay. Now, there's teaching on that. You can, you can just refresh your mind. You know those things are not good. They died in the wilderness over those, all seven of them. Now, here's the one. Do this. Are you ready? Because here's what God spoke to us prophetically within, the, uh, within I don't know, the last month or two. And he says, watch what I will do. I don't know about you, but after all of this, I'm ready for a solution. All right? We magnified the pain, did we not? <laughs> okay. Watch what I will do. I'm going to take you deeper. And that's, to me, that's an invitation to whosoever will. Watching by uh, YouTube, Ustream, watching on Sid Ross Network, uh, here in the room. It, it makes no difference whosoever. God says, watch what I will do, number one. Number two, I'm going to take you deeper. Number three, you're going to be a partaker of the divine nature. You need some gold in you, right? I want to, if I go deeper, it's to partake of the divine nature. You shall bear much fruit. And the fruit I saw in just three categories. The fruit of your lips, you're going to see your words are going to have stronger anointing and they're going to bring to pass the things that God intended to send that word forth. It won't return void without accomplishing something. Something redemptive. Righteous acts. You're going to start feeling led by the Spirit to do something that's Spirit-led and those righteous acts are going to produce fruit. And lastly, change lives, which is what we're all about. There's no, there's no baby food here to the large degree in this church. What we're looking for is primarily full stature, to bring to maturity, to take the things you've learned in your head and find out how do I do that, right? Now, all of this, God says, the fruit of your lips, the fruit of righteous works, the fruit of changed lives, and then he told us in our prayer time, it has begun. And we've already seen it happen. We've seen it happen in divine appointments, changed lives. Now, what was the purpose of it? It's the preparation for an open heaven. God's going to bring a particular open heaven over your life, but how do you position yourself? We know what not to do now. Now I want to know, how do I position myself for an open heaven over my life, over my church's life, over my family's life. And um, here's the first thing. Remember we talked about the five functions, and I said resisting? That's the one I want to get into, because here's, here's what happens. If you are feeling peace on the inside, and your life feels miserable, drudgery, pressure on the outside, well, you won't like that scripture. I'll skip that one. Though. Consider pure joy. <laughs> the testing of your faith is producing something. But really, if you have peace inside and you feel pressure on the outside to the degree that you resist with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit by maintaining your peace, you mature and you go deeper in the things of God. You get transformed. You're being tested. <clears throat> There's a testing that produces something. It's not all, oh, woe is me. The sky's falling. What did I do wrong? If you've got peace on the inside and there's tremendous pressure on the outside, God is positioning you for an open heaven. I suggest that you develop the character that he's trying to get and that you stay in peace regardless of the outward pressure. And outside pressure with peace inside can be a test of faith. And it can mature you to the degree you resist with the Word of God. We, 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 like, we don't like that one 
uh, consider pure joy when you suffer through various trials at the testing. We like submit to God, resist the devil, and he flees, and we want it right now. And it can happen that way, but not all the time. Look at those Hittites and the children of Israel. They just kept coming, all right? But to the degree you learn to stand in peace, having done all, stand. I believe God is positioning you for an open heaven in the days ahead, a stronger, more powerful anointing. So do this. When you feel that outside pressure, do this. We had uh, Matthew 5.44. You should write that down. You're going to love this. If you can, fast and pray. If you could just pray, pray. But pray this way. Matthew 5.40 says, Love your enemies. Uh, I'm releasing loving intercession of my enemies. I, don't even, I had people's faces flash before my mind. I don't even know if they were my enemy or not. But it was, felt so good to love them. <laughs> hey, if their face flashed, who knows? <laughs> well, they might be talking about you in a derogatory way. I don't know. But here's what the early church learned. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, we know the scripture as in Matthew, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, pray for those who persecute you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who despitefully use you. Would it be a far stretch to do what the Didache said? It told the new believers, the Gentiles that were clueless, love God, love people, love your enemies, fast and pray for them. Would adding fasting to this destroy that scripture at all? Love your enemies, bless those that curse you. Adding fasting to it would only tell me your praying is more sincere. Because I had somebody say, where's that in the scriptures? Well, <coughs> those early apostles, they said things different. It wasn't scripture. It was an outline of teaching that you apply scripture to. Pray for those that persecute you. I'll tell you what, in some cases, in order to do that, I would have to fast. <laughs> Wouldn't you? If you were really going to do it from the heart. And I did this um, over these last uh, uh, few days. And I'm going to tell you something. It feels like there's an open heaven over my life. What's it worth to you to know that your heart is clean and that you've blessed those who curse you and you may not even know who they are. So in cases I saw people, I saw people I haven't seen or thought of in years. And this really, I'll tell you what, you see what it does and what they're trying to teach these Gentiles? If you fast, if you pray for your enemies, I don't know what it'll do to them. Nothing wrong with blessing them. I don't know what it'll do to them, but it'll change your heart in the process, and you won't have any enemies. You change. Boy, I get so weary of Christians that have been around forever trying to change somebody else. Good luck. Men, if you're married, just say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> it go, things go so much better you can have an opinion as long as it matches hers I mean <laughs> you've got freedom okay I'm just messing with you now but anyway <laughs> anyway I'm in, I'm in withdrawal my wife's in, gone for five days our daughters are getting her PhD in molecular biology wow. and so she's spending time with her and the grandchild so but uh, I'm going to have the house all perfect and clean before she gets home. No dishes in the dishwasher. Nope. Nope. And they're already asking me at the grocery store, how's your wife? How are you doing? <laughs> what, do, I, do I look that... <laughs> See, they, 
men, you need to tr practice some of my lines, though, because it got their attention. We've evangelized the little grocery stores. <laughs> Sir, did you find everything you needed? Oh, I have everything I need. She's at home. <laughs> that usually gets a shock out of the women clerks, and the men kind of look clueless. <laughs> They are different, aren't they? The men and the women. They are, oh, they're different. Okay. <laughs> and one of them saw me combing her hair because she's got that short haircut and the wind blows and she goes in the store and her hair's all like this. I, I bring a comb with me to do that. And they're all going, <laughs> Try it sometime. But you might have to fast and pray. It doesn't hurt. I miss her. So, now, if you fasted and prayed for your enemies, there is a glory in the tribulation, Romans 5.3. It produces something. It's not a waste of time, and it's not drudgery, and it's not some kind of punishment. It trains you up in the love of God, because... Even the scriptures, if you love those that love you, what, what, what big deal do you have? Unsaved evil people can do that. Love them that love. All right? The, the real point is rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. Now, I find that... Uh, I'll use our little gold guy here, but James 1.14 said, each one is tempted when he's drawn away. Here's the enemy right up here, right up there. He's drawn away. Each one is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Like for me, it would be, I, sh I should have been a cop. I love them donuts. But it would be like, if I see the donut shop, it's like, I'm being, my bucket is going up to here. I was down until I saw the donut shop. And then my bucket came up, and my five senses taste, touch, smell. <gasps> I, I remember what those donuts taste like. I'm being drawn away. But when you're drawn away, what's happening to the bucket? You're, you're being drawn away from the rule of God into the sensual realm of the rule of the five senses. All taking place up here. Ooh, ooh, but what's the scripture say? What do I do? Dennis, Dennis, you're alone. Jennifer's not around and there's donuts. Oh, oh, what do I do? I mean, draw nigh to God. Doesn't it say that? Draw nigh to God. And what's he do? He draws nigh to you. And it's a law of central tendency that there is actually, when you choose to draw a night of God in your heart, he act, there's actually a pull, like gravity, to where uh, the illustration that, that, that showed me that was the prodigal. The prodigal finally, reluctantly, thought, oh, I'm tired of doing that. I'm going home. I'm going to go home. And he's walking. But the father was running. The father was running toward him. That's the uh, law of central tendency. That's the kind of gravitational pull that God has when you change your focus and draw a night. And go, oh, God. Oh. And then when I get down here and I get peace, he says, you can have one. You can have one donut. Moderation, you know. Maybe I'm negotiating. I don't know. It's still, it can still be a battle, can't it? Yeah. I want what I want, and I want it now. Oh, yeah, Christians that go, I want what I want, and I want it now. And they'll say, I have a peace about it. Don't use Christianese on me. That's not peace. That's called lust. And if you don't know the difference, you've got a ways to go. Amen? Amen. 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 You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. 
For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.